So welcome uh, again in uh, the early Netherlands. And I think the afternoon in, where are you, Victoria, right now? Uh, in the Gold Coast, the beautiful Gold Coast, Australia. Australia, okay. So I'm just waking up and she's at the peak of her performance, I guess. <laughs> and I'm talking with Victoria Brazil and we're talking about, um, well, I think simulation training and of particular interest, uh, stress exposure simulation training, as I just named it. A little combination of sim training and stress exposure training, and and the the, the goal, the goal is for facilitators, instructors, teachers, to uh, to gain a little more insights into uh, simulation training. And you published uh, before I give you the introduction. You you published an enormous amount of very important content, and we are here in the Netherlands are uh, well. I think you have some fans. <laughs> And especially <laughs> the the articles about uh, the participants' uh, experience of simulation training article, and and also the also from 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 there the the feedback and, and so on and so on and the podcast you did. So thank mm -hmm. you very much thank for you. taking the time. Well, they're very interesting topics, so I'm looking yeah. forward to talking with you about them. Yeah, and um, can you give a brief introduction what your what what your work is, what you're doing? Yeah, sure. So uh, I my background is as an emergency medicine doctor, and I've been doing that for about 30 years. Uh, but more recently, I've transitioned to spending most of my time now in healthcare simulation. And on and off, I've been doing that for about the last 20 years, involved mainly through a health professions education lens. And so involved in the training of medical students, junior doctors, emergency medicine trainees, but also into professional teams. So I sort of came to these topics from the world of teaching and training in healthcare. Uh, so I spend most of my time doing that. I work both at the health service, the hospital, where I'm the medical director of our simulation service, and I give some oversight and participate in simulation delivery to all kinds of teams around the hospital with all kinds of uh, objectives. Some of them are the high acuity teams that might have more in common with your background in intensive care and operating theater and emergency medicine and maternity. But a lot of the teams that we work with uh, work on other healthcare objectives, uh, things like palliative care, aged care, uh, some really important things about training for better patient experience. So pretty diverse simulation interests. Uh, and then I also work at Bond University, and that's, I guess, the more academic side of my work and where I get supported to do some of the work that you've obviously read and where we also do some simulation training for medical students, which is obviously a little bit different to the healthcare teams in the hospital. So uh, that's me. And uh, yeah, a little bit like you though, my, one of my other interests is in podcasting yeah. and I do the simulcast podcast and that's yeah. enabled me to meet a lot of other really interesting uh, simulation practitioners and, and particularly people in healthcare around the world. So uh, that's been heaps of fun. What, what can we just dive into simulation training and and, and what 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 is it by the way uh, i'm also an educator so to speak and i'm studied studied educational science and all those um yeah forms of education simulation training is one of these uh, uh these uh, how do you call it uh, mm, formats i suppose formats yeah. yes but what is simulation training? And I even saw an article when to use simulation training and when not. I'm not sure from whom, but it, it triggered me. So mm, what, mm. what is simulation training? And is it, is, is it the same as scenario training? Or what is simulation yeah. training? Really important, uh, Eric, because, of course, it means different things to different people. So I take a broad view of the term simulation. It might be everything as simple as practicing a procedural skill. A junior nurse practicing to give injections to a patient uses an orange, injects it with a needle. That's simulation. Uh, right through to now very advanced practice surgeons practicing laparoscopic surgery and with high-end virtual reality simulators and haptic feedback. So there's a bunch of simulation that is around, around practicing skills and tactile yeah. skills and visual skills, uh, decision-making. And then there's a range of simulation that is around uh, communication. So one of the things we do with our medical students is get them to practice talking to actors 
uh, who are acting as patients and who can give them feedback about their consultation skills and uh, and the tutors can give them feedback about how well they're gathering information to help inform their diagnostic skills. Uh, but you're right, I guess the bit that I've been most interested in is that form of simulation that is scenario-based. And uh, it's not to say the others aren't important, but it just happens to be the one I'm interested in. And in this iteration, there a simulation is essentially an experience where we're trying to replicate something that is real and challenging for a team. And then we're exposing them to that activity and having some space and time afterwards to reflect on performance. Now, I think one of the really good questions to ask with that is why don't you just reflect on the real patients? Because we have in my mm -hmm. emergency department, 300 of them come in the door every day. But there's a few reasons why simulation is appropriate to substitute for some of that. And that is that, well, sometimes it's rare things that you want to practice. Sometimes you just don't have time to reflect on your real world experience and simulation can give you a time and a space and a place to do that. Uh, and then I guess, secondly, it really allows us to provide some on demand. So if we specifically want to focus on a, top, a topic or a skill in a simulation, we can design it so that we can do that. Whereas obviously the patients that come in the door, it's much more haphazard and yeah. we may or may not get the experience that we want for our education. Uh, but yes, I think the in these scenario-based training, there's many potential outcomes we can have. And one of the challenges is trying to keep that narrow enough uh, because we can say we're going to run this scenario about looking after a patient with chest pain and we can end up thinking, oh, we want to practice what medications they need plus the communication with the team plus the patient experience, plus how we transfer them to the cath lab. And it's all too much. So one of the other really important things about effective simulation is deciding what it is you're trying to do and keeping any given scenario or simulation-based experience uh, time and, and enough space to do it justice. So yeah, it's a really good question. What is simulation? And I think it's a very broad church. Uh, but you're right, I guess, for the kind of things that we're moving towards talking to in terms of uh, recognizing and regulating stress responses uh, in a resuscitation room or other high acuity environment, then I think we are talking about scenarios, we're talking about teams, and we're talking about a, quite a dynamic form of simulation. And then the second question is, which I come around every, every, every time in police and military training, how important is fidelity? Uh, mm. A long time ago, I tried to keep up with the research about low fidelity, high fidelity, and, and what is best for transfer and retention, mm -hmm. but, but I lost a little bit sight of it, so I'm, I'm, not, I'm not very actual with it, but um, a half year ago, something strange happened. I had an interview with Professor Karen Rulofs, and she is a neuroscientist mm -hmm. from the Netherlands, studying mm -hmm. uh, human freezing behavior with a with a very important twist, but they developed a game for police for stress regulation. And it is the most low fidelity game you can imagine. They, they're just sh shooting at zombies. And I mm -hmm. asked Karen, uh, well, this is very low fidelity. How does it translate into real world policing? And she very explicitly spoke about the fact that in this case, in VR, it didn't matter uh, the fidelity, because it was all about um, getting the arousal up and teaching people to deal with it in that scenario. And there was, and they studied the transfer and the retention, and it was there. So that was a kind of surprise for me, mm. because on the other hand, there are researchers in police, for example, like Mario Stoller and Chris Butler. I think you spoke with. Who, um, and, and, and also in the realm of constantly the ecological psychology, would you say, no, you have to have a representative design. It should be high fidelity. So what's your take mm -hmm. on it? How, how, how realistic? Yes. Well, I think I'm more in the former camp. Uh, it depends what you're trying to do. So I think the term fidelity is not a very good one because mm. people misunderstand what they mean. And particularly in healthcare simulation, it was a term that came to mean 
a plastic mannequin with really complex electronic aspects to it. Mm. Whereas just as your first author you mentioned, uh, your learning scientist, neuroscientist, it's about what you're trying to achieve. So the term functional task alignment is actually much better. Mm. So have you got realism for the task that you are focused on? So if you are practicing laparoscopic surgery, you want very high fidelity tactile feedback and enough visual feedback of the inside of someone's abdomen so you can practice surgery. You don't need a very realistic head poking out of the end of it because that's not going to matter at all. All you actually want is a box that you can uh, do that sort of important um, what's tactile, what's important to you. But let's say you are practicing communication and you're trying to break bad news to a patient who's just been told that they've got cancer. You can't be using a plastic mannequin because that's not realistic if you're trying to look at someone's facial expressions and ascertain if they're understanding what you're saying and looking to see and picking up on cues and adapting your language. You're going to need high fidelity human actor because you need a person there. Uh, If we're talking about teams practicing performance in resuscitation environments, sometimes we have to make trade-offs. We'd love to have a real person there, but obviously we can't cut them open or do procedures on them. So we use mannequins, but we try and think, can the mannequin do, has it got the features and capabilities for the things that we want them to do? So if we want them to do certain procedures, that will have to be fairly realistic. But it means that we won't aim to make things more realistic just for their own sake. As an example, there's some mannequins around for pediatrics, which make little blue lights on the lips to communicate the idea that the oxygen saturations are low. And it just looks ridiculous. Mm. It doesn't actually send the cue of, oh, this patient is cyanotic or has got low oxygen levels. It just looks like a blue light on the lips. So I think being really thoughtful about what fidelity are we talking about? Is it physical realism? Is it team fidelity? I've got people around me I would normally work with. Is it task fidelity? I'm doing something that's usual for me. And I think all these kinds of elements, we need to think carefully about in our design rather than just making the vomit ever more realistic because it's not going to matter. Uh, you know, the patient vomits, we get the idea. It doesn't matter if it, we, it doesn't smell like it or look like it or whatever. But what I found interesting from the research from Professor Rulos was that they, they found that if the VR, so we're talking about VR, and I'm not sure if this is the same as, but uh, if it is, if it is too realistic, but like you're saying, but there is something off, like the blue light, then people don't buy in. Then, then they, then, then they, then you can better at forehand say it's not realistic and just yeah. To, and, yeah. So there is this uh, phenomenon of the uncanny valley. Yeah. And maybe she was talking about that. And that is where you get close to realistic yeah. to the point where actually people's engagement and perception of it is actually goes down. Yes, that's, yeah. yes. Yes, it's just yeah. a bit like bad plastic surgery. Yeah. It looks much worse than someone who may or may not be, you know, looking like a blonde bombshell. Uh, if they, plastic surgery is a good example where it's just not right. It's close, but it's not right. And so people's reaction to it is is generally negative. So now we have laid the groundwork. We have tried to give some specifics to what simulation training is and the fidelity question. And a question comes to mind right now, which I did not prepare for, but it's always like that. Yep. And, and that is, for me as a trainer, one of the biggest challenges has always been to to get the buy-in from the participants because in so much training you you put all the effort in and then they they don't buy in and they say this is not real and this will not happen and so on and so on and so on and some parts have to do maybe with with the fidelity there are other things but how do you do you have any evidence-based or personal experiences how how to to get people involved, and I mean really involved, like they yeah. are they are in the movie, so to speak. 
Yes. So I think this is much discussed. Uh, We don't have good measures of engagement. Most facilitators have a good gut feel for when they're uh, observing their learners or their participants, how engaged they are, but we don't have good measures of that. I think though, if we just take a rough and ready idea about are people seeming like they're buying in and they say later that that was realistic and they enjoyed the challenge of it and they found it realistic. Unfortunately, I think this is takes a lot of work and a lot of it happens over time. So for instance, I think the engagement you get from a team anytime you run a first simulation with that team is relatively low because you haven't spent the time building up the trust, Mm. the expectations of how to learn here and the understanding of the gaps between, of the necessary gaps between the simulation and the real world. There are, there are always some gaps. So I think one of the things is it takes time for learners to get to know the simulation environment and that affects their level of engagement. So some things you can't do anything about in the moment, but you can work on consistency over time and engagement will improve. Obviously, there are some strategies that facilitators can use in the moment and or even just before. So Some people make nice little videos so people can visually orientate themselves to the space and get a sense of what this simulation to reality gaps might be. Some people do a physical familiarization to the environment and whatever modality the patient is for today, whether that's a mannequin or an actor or a plastic piece of paper. Uh, And then I think you can have a conversation about this topic of engagement in the pre-briefing and saying really clearly, there's some gaps between simulation and reality. This is what we've done to try and help close them. We know that there are certain cues that you look for in these situations. This is how we've tried to give you those cues. Uh, And that will consist of, uh, you know, we've got this kind of monitor, we've got this kind of information on the patient. We'll have someone in the scenario to help close those gaps for you. And if we see that you're looking for the skin color and temperature, we'll tell you what you're finding. So to really help people understand that we know that there's a gap, but we will be very attentive to try and give people the cues that they would normally have. And then I think to have an explicit conversation, which is, by the way, this isn't real, but if you can buy in, that will help everybody else. Uh, to engage with this process and get more out of it. So we are asking a favor. And so this is, you know, another way of describing all these words is to use a fiction contract. And that's been described by Jenny Rudolph and the team at CMS. And I think that is a nice idea about an explicit conversation about the gaps between the simulation and reality. So I think all those things help. I think then your scenario design is important. And if I ask a group of medical students to look after a major trauma case, they won't be very engaged because they have no idea how to do it. They're not at that level. Whereas if I match a multidisciplinary team in the hospital to that kind of a trauma case, they will engage because this is interesting. It's challenging to them. It's the kind of work that they do. So when people don't engage, I think we do have to take some of that on board because sometimes it's our poor design. Sometimes it's our poor facilitation. So I think... uh, they're my thoughts about that. I don't think it's a simple topic, uh, but it's obviously very relevant, particularly if you're going to be pushing people at the sort of zone of proximal development yeah. uh, for their learning, which is actually what we want to do. We want the simulations yeah. to be challenging and realistic and yeah. engaging. Yeah. And, and maybe I, I would also like to have your thoughts about the following, in, in, especially in the two-day courses for, for medicine, but I think... We do it also in the military and in police. Is if we have two days, for example, we use some some work scenarios, so to speak. So, so for the for the medical team, these are med- medical uh, scenarios. But we use also some other things, like working at uh, at heights, heights. What is heights? Oh yes, yes, heights. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So it it has nothing to do with the work. Mm-hmm. Or, we, or we have some physical physical task and so on and so on. But our impression is, <laughs> strange thing is they, they most of the time like it in general. They, they see mm-hmm. it as a challenge. But we also get them a little bit easier 
if we talk about stress regulation strategies, some, some easier out of the comfort zone. Because for example, when I started to work with ambulance personnel, there was no way I could stress them because they had the a ABC protocols and all those protocols and whatever you did. This is a compliment, of course, for, for, their, for them. But uh, we wanted to, to have them experience what is arousal and how do you deal with it. Mm. And it is the same with Karen Rudolph's her research because the task is also not very, not very police relevant, but they get aroused and you, you have a little experience and you can reflect on it. But and of course we mix it with with uh, realistic uh, medical cases. But what 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 is mm. your what are your thoughts about it? Yeah, look, I think this idea about cross training oh, yeah. has many benefits. Uh, and to your point, does it matter if it's not the skill within the context? I think it matters a bit. I think you need some realistic things, yeah. just as you said, uh, but it may be that you do exercises that may be simulation based that are specifically and narrowly focused on something like um, getting stressed and trying to get a level of physiologic arousal that people can recognize and learn to regulate. Uh, I think there's also some benefits in that, in that sometimes when you do these challenging scenarios in a real world context for people, they have more evaluation apprehension. Mm -hmm. So if I'm about to do some difficult airway, I'll be thinking, oh my goodness, everyone's watching me. And this is something that really matters to an emergency medicine doctor. This is a thing that I should be expected to be able to do. So now suddenly I'm really worried about failing at it. And that actually does stop people engaging. And they sometimes say, oh, it's not very realistic. And of course I would have got it in the real world. Whereas if you took me to shoot zombies in the yeah. VR game, <laughs> I'm not going to be going, well, that's expected of me in my job. I don't have any evaluation apprehension. I may yet still get a level of physiological arousal that I can then use to reflect upon and work on those other things. So there is a, a, un, there's a sneaky advantage in doing some of those things that are outside our real world. Uh, but I think it's just part of an overall program. Yeah. I think you still want to be doing plenty of uh, realistic scenarios as well. Yeah, and, and then we have also experienced that different subgroups within, for example, the medical community react differently to it. So there are some mm -hmm. groups you can easily go for a run, so to speak, or doing some some crazy stuff. But there are also also doctors who don't buy in. They they just find it stupid to do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, oh, there's very yeah. there's very uh, clear professional cultures in the hospital. Yeah. We find that too, and I wouldn't yeah. be surprised that in Holland it's the same as it is in Australia. The yeah. emergency medicine people, you can do basically whatever you like. They'll like yeah. go, yeah, it seems like fun, but there's a lot of other groups who are in got more certainty based practices, yeah. and they don't like the unexpected, and no. that is not uh, not in their usual world. So they they don't like to have simulations that do that. And I think we have to be sensitive to these things yeah. uh, because we may not make much progress if we try and push too hard against people's cultural norms uh, yeah. in their practice. So I think uh, doing your homework on that, super important. Yeah. So uh, I, I saw that we have some f f six minutes left in the, in this uh, part one. Then... then um... I will send you an, 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 another uh, link okay. for it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that sounds so, good. So maybe maybe it's good right now because we have uh, we have talked about what simulation training is, about fidelity two times, um, and about uh, 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 psychological safety. I think also a little bit. We've I've used I've heard some terms like the prey brief, mm -hmm. evaluation, apprehension, and um, that, that's very nice. So maybe we can talk about some stages of of, of scenario design and facilitation. Sure. I was I was impressed with the we have the OSIM design. I, I'm not sure what OSIM, OSIM is European Society for Simulation Training, I guess uh -huh. something like yep, that. Yep. They uh, they have yep. a structure. Yep. But there are more, of course, and uh, so. For, for me, we we start with a briefing, pre briefing, then maybe some type of familiarization. And uh, well, well, maybe we can start with with the briefing or pre pre, pre briefing. 
Yes. What are the most important points? And you have already put it in, into articles very, very nicely. So, yeah. Well, I think the first thing is to to recognize how important it is. This isn't just a performative, let's just introduce each other because that's what we're supposed to do. It really is the moment where you say, okay, let's just be clear on why we're here. Let's build some rapport as a group about what we're trying to do and who we're doing it with and recognize that, you know, this will be a challenge and that we're going to respect each other's uh, efforts in putting themselves out there. So I think it's important in the spirit of gaining rapport, but also, I suppose, diagnosing the room and the learners. uh, I always start with a round the room. Uh, but I preface that with, okay, today we're going to be focused on X, Y, and Z. It's going to be an opportunity for us to practice this and to think about our teamwork. So why don't we start with around the room and you can tell me your name, your role, and why don't you just give us a top tip for these cardiac emergencies that we're going to be focused on today? And I think that's very nice because then people go around, they say something, uh, they introduce themselves. Everyone's got some sort of a tip, no matter what their background. And you get a chance then to demonstrate your active listening and to maybe paraphrase something they say and to show that you are interested in what they've got to say. And this makes them far more likely to take a risk in the sim or to take a risk in the conversations afterwards because they have picked up on the idea that you are actually interested uh, in what they've got to say or what they're doing. Uh, and that hopefully they've got the idea that they won't be familiar, uh, humiliated, but rather respected for their contributions. So I think that round the room for me gives a really important uh, starting point. And what people say is also important because it's almost like then we start the conversation, we're going to pick back up in the debrief. And if someone has a tip that is, oh, I think it's really important to keep the patient in the loop, even when we're this busy, we might come back to that in the debrief. So I think it's also a chance to register some information. So pre-brief is the round the room, the gaining rapport, the diagnosing where people are at. And then I think then you put in your information about being clear on the expectations, being clear on what gaps there are, doing this fiction contract that we were talking about earlier, and really just seeing if others have got questions, queries, uh, if there's new people in a group, have the group got any other thoughts or suggestions or helpful uh, tips about how to get the most out of the simulation process. So it doesn't have to take long. I think it can take five or 10 minutes. Uh, It can take longer if you've got a bigger group, I guess. But I think you've got to do something that sort of sets a line in the sand that says, this is what we're here to do. And I'm so pleased that we're all here to do it together. And I'm interested in you. Great. And, And if we talk specifically about what I just for a moment called stress exposure simulation training, I try to to, to combine the, the, the stress exposure training with the sim <laughs> in yep. one term. Um, what, what is the place to, to talk about the topic in the sense that, for example, according to Driscoll and the stress exposure training, you have a kind of information phase like psychoeducation, mm-hmm. then you have some practice, and then you have scenarios. But if we talk about pressure training, where do we start to talk about or do we start to talk about what is stress? How does it influence us? And what are we going totally. to do? So I guess in a situation like mine, that would form part of the pre-reading that we would send around some resources for people to think about. And that would be my first question. I would be in the in the round the room. I would just be saying, so to be really clear today, a bit different to other weeks, we're going to be focused on stress. Uh, what causes it when we're in the recess room, how we manage it, how we recognize it, how we regulate it so that we can preserve performance in the face of it. So as we do around the room, tell me your name and your role. And uh, in this group, I'm sure we've already got people who are doing a great job of this. So why don't you share something that you find helpful when you're feeling stressed in the recess room? So we usually have a very good discussion even before we start based on some of people's shared experiences and practices, and we get a sense of what causes the stress, uh, what impacts does it have, and then how do we mitigate them? And I keep that structure as we go through the debrief, but I like to introduce it in this pre-brief. So to your point, I guess we don't have a lot of instructional time in our sims, but I think if you've got a good amount of diverse 
preparatory material, an opportunity to discuss it a little bit in the pre-brief, and then we do our simulations. I would love to have Driscoll's hours of uh, yeah. instructional stuff, but for us, that's probably not that practical. But I think we can provide some useful reading for people and uh, podcasts and other things. So I think it's a it's a compromise. Yeah, I think, yeah. So what, one last question before we uh, go to part two is, are there any data or personal experiences about uh, the, the pre-reading? Because we also try to do it, but, and this is jo just improvising, but I guess not everybody reads or listens because they are all yeah. busy, of course. Of course, so, yeah. um, and, and then we have a deep dilemma because on the one hand, we say, okay, if, if they didn't read it, well, it's their responsibility, so we just move on. But at the same uh, yes. time, you, you, you're losing it. <laughs> yeah, totally. Very simple thing for us is we find pre-reading gets done much more often when people are coming to simulations than any other education activity because they know it will help them in a stressful situation. So if they they often do do their pre-reading before they come to simulations, unlike some of the other educational things we do, because okay. they know it will actually help them uh, cope. Yeah. 